Hello and welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast brought to you by AMS Media. As ever, I am your host, Harry Simeon. I've got to apologise that there's been less content over the last few weeks. We've gone down from three shows to pretty much two now, and that's just because there is a lack of football. And I haven't got to that point yet where I feel it's worth uh, talking about some of the nonsense transfer rumours that are doing the rounds at the moment. We know that football is in a very, very strange place. Uh, The current uh, global pandemic is having a massive impact on all walks of life, all aspects of life. So to think that there are clubs actually doing transfer negotiations at the moment seems a little bit far-fetched for me, number one. And number two, these rumours that seem to be doing the, the rounds, that they don't seem to have any credibility. They're not coming from particularly reliable sources and therefore not quite got to that point where I'm going to be drawn into those so I'm trying to stay away from that and that's why we're trying to bring you um, you know content that is relevant and content about the the current talking points in football um, which of course are all centered around this viral outbreak and the impact that it's having and and the the first point I want to discuss on this edition of the podcast is of course uh, the Premier League's project restart. Now there's been lots of talk about this in the last few days. Is it feasible? Can it be done? Will it be endangering the players, the staff, and all those people required to bring football to you? Because football isn't just about the 22 men on the pitch. You know there is so many um, people involved in in bringing the games to you. The production side of things is massive as well. Um, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, when the Germans submitted their plans in regards to how they were planning to bring back the Bundesliga, I think they counted around about 312 people was the bare minimum that they needed to be able to get these games played, get them televised so the fans can uh, can be involved that way at least. And, you know, so there is a lot more to it than people think. Now, there are some pros to Project Restart if, of course, they can... Uh, get it over the line if the government advice allows it the government uh, legislation i guess allows it um you know there are pros it's good for people's morale i don't know about you guys but i'm really really missing football i've heard people say that they've become disinterested in the game and i think that disinterest comes from the fact that there's nothing to watch and there's nothing going on therefore naturally you lose interest it doesn't mean that people have turned off from being football fans or anything like that but Given there is no football taking place, this is usually such a crucial, pivotal part of the season. It's a very different feeling. It's a very strange one. And the longer it goes on, you know, the more people are going to start feeling that way because there is no date in sight. There is no view as to when this is going to come back at the moment. It's always been, you know, we're aiming for this, but, you know, it's dependent on this, this and this. So until they actually put a date in, until government um, relaxes the the lockdown rules and and there is a clear date in sight, I don't think many people are going to be showing much interest in the game. And it's a a shame, but it's understandable because at a time like this, when people's health is the priority, it makes you realise just how insignificant football can be. And and to us, you know, it's a huge part of our lives. And I don't think I've realised how much of a role it played in my day-to-day life until it stopped. But when you look at the grand scheme of things and you look at how many people are dying day in, day out as a result of this horrible disease, it's impossible to make the case that football is more important than that, that football should take precedent. Yes, it will boost those who are stuck indoors, who are uh, suffering, and mental health is is an issue. Um, I'm fortunate enough that I I don't suffer from anything like that, but I have had my days um, during this lockdown. I've had days where my temper, um, you know, I, I've lost it so quickly over stupid little things, um, you know, getting irritated by the slightest thing. I really, really miss socialising. I, I can be honest, I, I don't particularly miss um, going to bars or clubs or anything like that. I can get by without doing that. Um, you know, but I have missed not being able to see my family, not being able to see my friends, even in our own homes. So, you know, yes, I think football will will boost people's morale and it will help some people, uh, you know, cope with the, the current circumstances. So I think that is one of the pros. I think another pro is that it would maintain the integrity of the sport. Now, there's been a lot of talk about people being named as champions or Liverpool being named as champions. Who's going to get relegated? Who's going to come up from the championship? Who will play in Europe, etc., etc., etc. And the fact is that unless we play the remaining fixtures, 
there is no way of settling this without having some complaints from some quarter. There will always be somebody who's unhappy with the solution. And even if we do play the games in the way that the Premier League are are proposing, we're going to have people moaning about that as well. Um, because we've already had a load of clubs um, complaining about the fact that they don't want to play at neutral venues. Well, if playing at neutral venues makes it easier to guarantee the safety um, you know, of those players and the staff involved and makes it easier for that to be policed and controlled and minimises, I'm not going to say totally gets rid of the risk because you can't do that, but you can minimise it. If playing at neutral stadiums does that, then it's absolutely the right way to go. Um, there are clubs, in my opinion, using this scenario to their advantage, or trying to anyway, who are trying to wriggle their way out of relegation trouble, um, out of the financial impact that that has on their clubs by kicking up a stink about this proposal. It is fairer that the games are played in neutral stadiums than it is for the season to just be called at this point. And, you know, those teams go down. Um, Liverpool awarded the title. The European places are given to those who currently occupy those positions. For me... It has to be played out. Now, there is an argument that we need to wait a little bit longer um, to see what's going to happen, to see whether this is possible. But the reality is that we're probably not going to have crowds in football stadiums for the rest of the year. So if that's the case, then and you haven't got your crowd, what's the difference if you play the game at Wembley or if you play the game on your home pitch or if you play the game at St George's Park like some people are proposing? Home advantage is given to you by the supporters. Yes, you know the dimensions of the pitch. You know your surroundings. Great. That is important as well. Um, but it is the fans that are the key factor when you're talking about home advantage. So if there's going to be no fans anyway, I don't see what the big issue is, which makes me feel that these clubs are just trying to get one up on the Premier League at the moment. They're just trying to find a way of saving their own asses from the financial problems that this pandemic has brought but also those that they will be upon them if they are to suffer relegation they're trying to prolong it they're trying to delay it as long as possible and i am not at this point particularly optimistic that a solution is going to be found the solution that everybody votes on and i feel like if this season is going to be completed the premier league just have to put their foot down and say this is what we're doing like it or lump it, and if you don't like it, you're going to forfeit your remaining games, and the table's going to end up with you missing out on, you know, seven, eight games, nine games, whatever it is the, these teams have got left. I think that the Premier League are going to have to stamp their authority, force people's hands, but with the caveat that they can only do that if they can guarantee a certain level of safety. I think they can if they do things right. Um, I want to see football return as much as the next person, but not at the risk of people getting sick, not at the risk of not just the footballers, but the staff involved and the families of those involved being put in danger or in harm's way because we haven't done things properly for the game of football. So that's kind of my, my take on it. Um, the clubs that are insisting that we play without the threat of relegation, as I've already said, they're only in this for their own gain. They're only talking about this for their own advantage. I mean, if it's the case of taking relegation off the table, then why are we playing out the rest of the season? The whole point in playing out the rest of the season is to maintain the integrity. It's to make sure that we do it in the fairest way possible. Is it going to be 100% completely fair? Probably not. But these are unprecedented times, unprecedented circumstances that nobody could have predicted, that nobody knows how to deal with or has experience of dealing with. So if you're going to take relegation off the table, then I say don't play out the rest of the season. What is the point? What is the point of taking even the smallest risk to bring back the game of football prematurely if the the results are not going to have any impact on whether a team stays in the division or not? It makes no sense to me. If that's the case, scrap the season. Call it a day and we start again in August. That's just my view. Let me know what you think in the comments as well. Um, and it would just prove, wouldn't it, to all the Premier League fans out there that this is nothing more than being about money. 
you know, playing the game so that TV broadcasters can get their money's worth. But I tell you what, those TV broadcasters will be showing dead rubber fixtures. And will that impact on their viewing audiences? I think it will. Will it impact on their relationship with the Premier League moving forward? Probably. Because they've paid tons of cash to get these broadcast rights and then they'll essentially be showing dead rubber fixtures that don't mean anything because the league are going to take a view that there will be no relegation in empty stadiums and that could do a lot of harm in my opinion to the game so I keep saying it maintain the integrity of the competition but that means that the results that come out of these behind closed doors fixtures should they be played have to be honoured otherwise what is the point what is the point? Um, you know, and I want to hear from you guys as well. Let me know your take on that. Um, just uh, want to touch on a couple of other bits and pieces and uh, read a, a fantastic interview by Mike Stavrou, who I'm sure you guys have all heard and seen on this podcast on numerous occasions over at Metro Sport. He caught up with Kevin Campbell, who suggested that Arsenal should sign Willian uh, from Chelsea and Ryan Fraser on free transfers. Of course, both of those players' current contracts expire with their respective clubs, Chelsea and Bournemouth, uh, at the end of this current campaign. Would you like to see any of them come in? I've I've got this thing where, you know, I look at William and I think he's a good player and I think, yes, he's a little bit probably over the hill coming towards the twilight of his career, but he is a talented individual. I think he could provide quality in that final third where perhaps we're lacking at times. And I think when you look at the likes of Reese Nelson, you look at him and you think, yeah, he's got ability, but does he always produce that final ball, that moment in the final third that makes a difference. And there is an argument that he doesn't. Therefore, I can see why people are interested in, in Arsenal bringing William to the club. However, does it make sense in the longer term? No, because when you look at those front three positions, you know, assuming that everybody stays put, you've got Lacazette, you've got Aubameyang, you've got Martinelli, you've got Pepe, you've got um, Nelson, as I've mentioned, you've got Bukayo Saka, who likes to play there as well. Um, you know, there's a possibility that Henrik Mkhitaryan could be coming back as well. So for me, that isn't a priority area for Arsenal. And with William in particular, He's going to want a hell of a wage packet um, and probably a signing on fee considering that he's a fr- going to be a free agent. Therefore, to me, that one doesn't make sense and I don't think I'd be doing it. Will he probably add some quality? Yeah, I think he would. Um, I think he's an experienced player and it's never a bad thing to have those kind of players around the place. But do those advantages outweigh the disadvantages? And I think given the financial impact of COVID-19, given the fact that we're not in the greatest financial state as a club anyway, um, that we're set to probably miss out on Champions League football once again, I don't think it makes sense to load that wage bill any further. So for me, it's a no-go. Um, completely respect the opinion of Kevin Campbell, of course, but for me, I have to disagree with that one. As for Ryan Fraser, I genuinely don't see the fuss about this guy. Um, yes, his his assist stats over the last few seasons have been pretty impressive, etc. But for me, he's not a top, top class player. He's not an upgrade on the players that we currently have in those positions. Therefore, it's again, it's a no from me. Um, you know, again, at risk of overloading that wage bill, we already talk about Arsenal being a, a club with a Champions League wage bill working on a Europa League budget. So how does bringing in a couple of players like that who aren't necessarily going to improve us enough, in my opinion, make any business sense? It doesn't to me. I've got to be honest. And just finally, um, the last topic that I want to touch on today is uh, William Saliba, who, of course, is planning to head to London early um, after his loan spell with St Etienne has come to an end. And it's only come to an end because of the COVID-19 outbreak, because the French League has been called, it's been cancelled. Um, therefore, he's no longer required at St Etienne and his loan spell has been cut short. Nothing good has come out of this this pandemic, not a single thing. Um, people are dying. Economies are going to really, really suffer. Um, life as we knew it has completely turned on its head. And that's going to take some time uh, for people to get back to normal. And even when they do, are they ever going to be completely normal? Are, are people ever going to go in crowded pubs the way they used to and, and, you know, 
share warm embraces is that going to happen probably not it's probably going to be a long long time before the scars of this virus um heal and before people fully move on from this but William Saliba joining up with Arsenal early is a positive um and again I don't mean to be disrespectful to anybody who suffered from this horrible virus that's not my point my point is here that William Saliba will get more time with Mikel Arteta and the rest of his teammates he will um you know, be able to undergo that embedding process um, that every player has to go through when they arrive at the club, um, you know, out of the limelight, so not under any particular pressure. Um, and I think it could be good for him. I think there's there's talk about him coming back and getting on with some one-on-one training. Um, it's important that his fitness levels are managed because, of course, William Saliba will be, um, you know, at a point where... If he's not going to play games, he has to maintain that level, but also with a view to winding it down ahead of the preseason so that you can then build it back up to its peak um, in time for the new season. So there's so much to consider, and it's about individually managing different players. You know, there'll be players who have been away um, as a result to this uh, of what's going on at the moment and have been maintaining their fitness levels really, really well. But you can also bet there will be others that won't have been doing as much. And so Mikel Arteta has got a really difficult job on his hands and his staff as well in terms of identifying those who need a more vigorous program, those who have maintained it. And it's about keeping at a certain level and not burning out. There's so much to consider. This has been such a disruption um, to everything. And... um, it will be interesting to see, of course, uh, how they di- deal with that, whether we'll see different players starting games when we do eventually come back because of this. Who knows? Um, you may see others getting opportunities just because their fitness levels are closer to where they need to be than others. So there's so much to consider. Um, this will be a really, really difficult time for Mikel Arteta and the players. Of course, he knows firsthand what it's like to have the virus, and so he won't be taking any chances with himself or with his players, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, it's it's a really difficult time, and fingers crossed we can see the Premier League resume, but like I say, with the caveat of it being as safe as it possibly can be. And of course, the players have to want to do it, don't they? That brings me to the end of this short episode of the Chronicles of Aguna. A big thank you uh, to those of you for tuning in, whether you're on YouTube or via the audio. Don't forget to like, subscribe, review, share, comment. You know the drill by now. And we'll be back very, very soon with another episode. So until then, take care of yourselves, stay safe and stay home. Cheers. <laughs>